Excellent. Uh, and I am assuming both teams are also ready. So we can get started. Uh, and therefore, I call upon the first speaker of side proposition uh, to open this debate up for us. OK, I'll start in a few seconds. In 2015, Cape Town suffered its worst drought in history. People were limited to one liter of water per day, a literal humanitarian crisis. While the common folk were dehydrating and dying, the rich in the gated communities were using millions of liters of water to water their gold fields. That is the comparative of inequality. Separation will never make people equal. Very proud to propose. In our case, three arguments. Firstly, why do gated communities entrench segregation? Secondly, how do gated communities harm cities and people? And thirdly, how do we improve the well-being of poor people? But first of all, some framing in our model. Firstly, we tell you that as urban areas become more populated, cities become more and more expanded, and the process of suburbanization accelerates. As suburban areas become more expanded more, gated communities become more prevalent and can also expand. This has been a growing trend panel, thus the only way to stop the segregation and privileged areas is to ban them. Now our model, we would ban gated communities, meaning no living areas of the city can be surrounded by gates. All city areas need to be accessible to everyone. This looks like streets, parks, kids' playgrounds, and etc. So that that's established, let's move into the first argument, why do gated communities entrench segregation? The thesis is that gated communities disallow certain people from accessing housing and trenching discriminatory practices. Note the historical context of gated communities panel. It comes from similar practices of red line in the United States when certain areas host more higher class people with more luxurious amenities while others are overpopulated with lower class individuals. Currently the same practices exist under gated communities where within fenced areas private kindergartens or luxurious shops are established. At the end those people living in such neighborhoods are literally separated from reality and living in their own Truman shows that are protected by real estate agencies that differentiate the potential buyers of real estate and decide whether to sell or not. <laughs> know the incredible segregation when a city is being divided into such territories where not all individuals are allowed to walk such amenities which not individuals are allowed to use. Look, we think that ultimately a city's public spaces inherently belongs to everyone that is living in it and thus should not be owned by any certain type of individual or group of one. The burden of opposition in this debate thus is to prove why certain people can exclude others from using public services. Why can guards with guns stop everyday citizens from walking on a certain street or playing in a certain park? We think the segregation happens not only on the basis of financial capabilities of a certain individual, but race and other factors as well. Literally look at a wealthy like Black individual not being allowed to move in to gated communities just because of their race that the surrounding people do not approve of. Look, at the end of this argument, note how on their side, their principle of freedom of choice defends the most privileged that have exploited thousands to get into the material place they are in. We think that not only this impact is not important, but we're happy to not support their comfort. Before I move into second, I can take that point. In general, would you support policy which aims to break up religious or ethnic enclaves? We don't think that the debate is about that. I will not answer this question. Moving into the second argument, how gated communities harm cities and people. Three layers here. First, on a horrible allocation of funds. Second, on perceptions and scrutiny they have a wealthy face. And third, on changing the image about the lives of people. Now, moving into the first layer on the bad allocation of funding. Look at the skewed divestment of public goods. Wealthy people are being able to establish themselves in the segregated communities allows for a constant cycle of overdevelopment of those communities. Rich people often live in overabundance and opulence. We intuit that they often abuse the power they have in order to divest city resources towards themselves. Notice how often heads of city government or politicians in general tend to live in these gated communities as well, given their class status and privilege. Politicians and people there are likely to go to the same banquets to be campaign donors, needless to say they have rubbed elbows. As such, the general energy, water, heating, needs of the city tend to skew towards the upper classes through their ability to outright segregate themselves from the rest of the city. When power is limited in Bogota, Colombia, then the energy is cut to the very poorest region 
regions, while gated communities always have it. We think this is unjust. When we ban the gated communities, it sends a strong message that these resources should not be hoarded, right? Comparatively, on our side of the house, we don't have communities of wealthy individuals who are able to self-organize into protecting their own interests on how the city infrastructure is developed. Now, moving into the second layer on perceptions and the scrutiny that the wealthy face. Notice how usually the exclusivity of these gated areas is that they are closed off from the public eye. Media reporters are not allowed unless the rich lifestyle is portrayed positively, right? Average individuals cannot see for themselves the privileges that are available to some, but not to others. The entire perception of these communities is easily controlled by them themselves, given that what comes out uh, through the borders of the wall is only what the rich agree with. This becomes problematic when no one can hold these people accountable and no one knows how they abuse their wealth and the inequalities that are prevalent, right? And there are some of the house when these spaces are like publicly accessible and no longer gate kept by the rich, the society is able to see the outrageously lavish lives of them. When in Lagos, the drought was putting thousands of the poor to death due to water limitations, but the rich still watered their gardens with no moderation whatsoever, the people got mad panel. The media fostered the outrage of the society. The governments were pushed to change this nonsensical law. But then on the third layer are changing the image about the lives of people. Okay, look, the existence of borders and the accumulated wealth in these areas impacts the way individuals see the world and see other citizens, right? This looks like adults who have lived there for 20 plus years are like very distanced from the life of an average individual. They live in constant paranoia and fear of minorities or like poor people. But secondly, their kids also get accustomed to the rich life and like grow up with pink glasses, right? Having no idea about the general conditions of like middle or lower class people and like the conditions they have to work with. They lived closed lives and have learned from their parents that they should have material superiority to like be successful people and that they're better than everyone else. We think that ultimately these perceptions are bad as they portray unrealistic lifestyles, make people feel foreign to one another, right? And impact the way they live their lives and what kind of change they push for generally in like their communities. But like, how does this change then under our side of the house? We tell you that ultimately as gates are banned, there are no more like security guards, there are no more like fences where people literally cannot even walk. People of different social classes will inevitably assimilate with each other and see each other much more now because the areas become public spaces. This looks like parks, playgrounds, supermarkets, cinemas, whatever it is, right? This is a net good as interactions with people who live worse lives than you give you more empathy and understanding and a sort of perception that you haven't thought of before or haven't seen before, right? For example, if you see a mother and her child playing with broken toys while your child has like the newest toys and so many of them, you're likely to tell him to give some of his toys away. You're likely to have your heart hurdled a little bit because this is the first time and the only time you have seen this in your life, right? But even when kids of different financial backgrounds play together in a playground, they have the possibility of becoming friends, right? Something that would never happen under side opposition, breaking the cycle of only having elite connections. Friendships between rich and poor people ultimately lower inequality at the point at which you want to help your friend, at the point at which then you kind of break the cycle and assimilate with people of different social classes. So because we've shown you the net benefit of banning gated communities, very proud to propose. Thank you. Judge is all set. Excellent. We thank the speaker for their speech and call upon the first speaker of team opposition to deliver theirs. Uh, can I, I'm audible. 
Uh, could you say that again? Can I confirm that I'm audible? Yeah. Cool. <laughs> If people in these communities are as scared as Proposition says, then that is the exact reason why they are the ones in this debate that inflame tensions. That is why fearful people in power that they want to talk about in these communities are more likely to crack down upon the people they say are suffering, more likely to ban public housing in these areas, more likely to rise the prices of living and make the, these, the, the lives of these people hell. That is what happens when you open those communities. And even worse, they create a veil of legitimacy that the equality has been fixed when in reality, they're simply entrenching it. I'm going to deal with the, their best case in this debate, which is only the rich communities they want to talk about. But I would note that there is a whole range of other gated communities that exist. So I'm going to talk about in my speech, they only deal with one set. So the first thing I'm going to do is firstly do one piece of rebuttal, and then I'm going to answer three questions in the speech. The rest, the rest will be integrated. Firstly, their main claim in this debate is to say that you will be diverting resources in a way that's particularly unfair. There are two responses to this. Firstly, it's unclear why as soon as you get rid of these gated communities, you, these, the diversion of resources no longer happens. We would note that zoning for schools still exists. That is to say that you can only go to schools in your particular area. These will simply now be rich suburbs, which is unclear why that's specifically better. But the second thing to say is that you lose all capacity to increase equality in other ways. But the people who are rich, the people these guys say in power, are now incredibly upset they have lost these communities, meaning that it's actually under this opposition where they're less likely to get things like public housing, they're less likely to get benefits for the sorts of people that this opposition is trying to protect. With that in mind, three questions I'm going to ask in this speech. Firstly, what do gated communities actually look like? Second, why do people have the right to live in these communities? And finally, why does the banning of gated communities worsen the tensions in the cases that opposition wants to talk about? Firstly, what do these gated communities look like? Because we reject that the, the only gated communities that exist are the ones that opposition says are incredibly racialized or are incredibly rich. Because we would say there is a whole spectrum. And we will note that often it is racial minorities and diasporas who are able to create these gated communities. And note that whilst opposition asserts that it's only these rich people who are making these communities, we're going to give you two reasons why we think that there are a huge range of minorities who are able to open up these communities and therefore benefit from them. The first thing to say is that we think that privileged people they want to talk about have other areas to go to because the, like other rich areas, whereas racial minorities or people from specific diasporas often don't feel safe in any other places other than being surrounded by people they know. That is necessarily a reason why the, the, the why these gated communities in these debates aren't the only ones that opposition wants to talk about. But secondly, because safety is a key priority, because we will know that in many in many other areas where there are more people going to a specific school, that naturally means that that school has more resources, which is to say that it's often not the best facilities that exist inside these gated communities, but the number one priority when you go to these communities is safety, and that is necessarily why there is a broader spectrum of these communities that this opposition has not talked about, that is racial minorities, that is often women, that is people from religious sects who care about each other in that specific way that opposition has not engaged with. So with that in mind, the vast bulk of opposition's appeal is contingent of proving that there is only one set of gated communities. We have explained that there's a whole other range we're going to say that we gain benefits from. So the second question I'm going to answer in this speech is why do people have the right to live in these communities? Because recognize that as a general principle, we should allow people to associate with those who they like. Because we recognize we, we recognize that when we allow clubs to exclude individuals because it affects everyone, it affects their safety, it affects their identity, and that is in the same way as we would allow diasporas to exist right now, which perhaps aren't or gated, but are still your choice to associate with those people there. And note that there is a huge set of people who are now necessarily able to benefit. That is ethnic minorities who live in these diasporas and these communities. That is Asians in America who feel scared to walk on the street because they feel like they might be attacked under the COVID crisis. But secondly, that is often people from Jewish communities who are gated or people from other religious sects who feel that they are protected inside these communities where otherwise they might be discriminated against. Those are all communities that this opposition has not talked about. They only want to talk about the really rich and privileged ones. But notably, we have given you the reason why that is not this entire debate and why there's these other people who are likely to benefit. What does that benefit look like? Firstly, it looks like feeling more safe. It means like knowing your neighbors. And it means like in that case, even if you're not more safe, you have the perception of being safe when you go to bed at night. And when you wake up, you know that you can walk the street and not be discriminated against. Secondly, it means that you feel like you're a community because you naturally see each other more when you walk into the same restaurant 
restaurants when you see each other at, at these amenities, and that necessarily means that you create more connection, and that is valuable. And note that they've recognized that the burden on opposition in this debate is enormous, because they don't just have to prove this is a suboptimal decision. They have to prove that it's so bad that we should entirely ban everyone from doing that. And that means that they have to prove an incredible harm. So we, just, we have explained that we have a huge benefit to many of those people. And note the immense impact of this argument, because even if you think we're only talking about a small group of people, the size of harm that we prevent for those minorities, for those people from religious sects is huge. It means people not being beaten up in their own neighborhoods. It means like going to bed each night, knowing that you're safe from people who hate your race. That is something that is incredibly important. Even if proposition says that is not the majority of communities, we would say that that is still something that is worth preventing. And that is a harm they lose out on. The final thing I'm going to talk about then in this speech is why the banning of gated communities worsens tensions. And note that this deals with this opposition's best case, where we're only talking about the really rich, white, privileged communities they want to talk about. I'm going to go into that now, but before that, I'll take a point. Look, the motion literally says strictly controlled entrances. Do you really think that ethnic enclaves or poor minority but diasporas somehow control entering the community with armed guards or something? I think that minorities of many professions exist and they're able to transfer as migrants to many of these countries. Building a gate is not something that necessarily costs immense amounts of money. What we are saying is that we're able to do things such as create these communities. And even if you guys claim that that is small, we have already given you reasons why those are likely to be the majority of communities because safety is the priority because rich people are able to go to other places without feeling discriminated against whilst the set of people that we have talked about head on. All that is to say that the characterization in this debate is the one that we're talking about, and I'm going to deal with your best case now. So finally, why is it that even in this opposition's best case, where they talk about where these tensions exist, they're the ones who make that worse? That's for three reasons. Firstly, because these people feel like there is something being stripped away from them, and that necessarily means that you blame the other group who you think is benefiting by this. But secondly, because presupposed opinions mean that you are likely to be racist in the ways that opposition says, but it's likely to be worse because you see them more, and that necessarily means that you have more capacity to be racist against them. But thirdly, because on pure chance, if you have the interest of being against someone and you have the capacity to do so, at the point where you feel more threatened, that necessarily means that you're more likely to do the sorts of harms that opposition is actually trying to prevent. What does that mean in this debate? Firstly, it means that these people in power are more likely to explicitly crack down. It means lobbying against public housing in these areas. It means creating laws against these groups which they dislike and are fearful for, and in, in fact, more fearful because you've gotten rid of their gated community. That notably flips the vast majority of this opposition's material, because to the extent that people now feel more scared and now uh, work harder to oppress the people they want to talk about, that is necessarily a harm on their side. But secondly, because implicitly, when gated communities are open, that still means that there is likely to be harm for the reason that cost of living are likely to increase at the point where rich people are all using the same amenities as everyone else, which necessarily means that even if you don't crack down explicitly, there's still implicitly a harm. That is prices rising. That is less bulk billing doctors. That is all the sorts of things that we think are likely to happen under their side. The final thing to say is that we think this actually worsens. Because not only does this opposition harm these people and raise these tensions and festers them over time, but they necessarily destroy the capacity to do all sorts of other policies that can actually create equality. That is better public education. That is better public housing. And the reason why they can't do that in this debate is because the rich people they say are in power are likely to be incredibly upset for the reasons that they have lost all the benefits we've talked about before, which is to say that they cannot claim that under their side, which means that that heavily raises their burden. Not strategically why that's important. Because even if you believe that they have some level of benefit under that side, they have to prove that is greater than all the sorts of benefits we might be able to get from the political will we could have from having better policies, having more equality, and having the sorts of things that actually increase equality rather than what they say, which is opening up these communities. At the end of this speech, so proud to oppose. Thank you. Not yet. I can pass my to you. Um, I'm not sure how it's speaking. Uh, Australia, if you could mute yourselves. Thank you. Also, if possible, um, could Team Australia be visibly on camera uh, for the duration of the debate? Okay, thank you.
Judge is all set. Cool. In that case, we thank the speaker for their speech and call upon the second speaker side proposition to deliver them. Okay, hi. Um, once again, I take POIs audibly. So if we were to just unmute yourself, say point or something like this, uh, that would be appreciated. I will start shortly. Okay, I'll start my speech in three, two, one. Whilst the entire of opposition's refutation to our material exclusively hinges on the fact that we are trying to destroy ethnic enclaves and religious communities within cities, if I am able to prove that this is not the case, not the agent we are even trying to address within this motion, and why their analysis is innately nonsensical, I believe that we have already won this debate at the point at which we strategically identified the agents which are actually affected. I can be proud to stand side proposition and in my speech, I will overlook a few issues within this debate. Um, uh, go, re refute the points that they have made, and then I'll make a third argument about like uh, 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 making the city more comfortable and better for the lower classes, which will also like innately uh, uh, tackle some of the material that has already been brought by side opposition. Okay, on the idea of ethnic enclaves and like religious communities and why this is like not the case and why we are debating them, right? I think it is genuinely absurd for them to claim that like you know these communities which have essentially been segregated into these areas. Yes, not segregated themselves out of the cities and which they want to disassociate from, right, are the ones which are now we are trying to destroy or etc. right? We're telling you that these people are unlikely to have the capacity to even gate themselves off, especially at the point at which like often these ethnic enclaves and their like economic activities hinge on like tourism, right? Hinge on the idea that like people can go around and shop in there, right? The establishment of Chinatown shops, right? The establishment of uh, Vietnamese restaurants and ethnic enclaves and etc. right? We're telling you that these, and then they say like, no, oh, but these like, it's not, you don't need like immense money for you to have, uh, you know, to build a gate or whatever. But it does take immense money for you to segregate yourself out of the city entirely at the point at which, you know, we have to buy out bulks of real estate, have these large communities, which are not going to be like inside the city center. Even if they are within the city center, then we are telling you that it's likely that the class disparity of those ethnic minorities is already incredibly vast. And it's not, likely that they have like you know within you know you know like the united states you have like some sort of ethnic enclave of incredibly rich only like asian people you know who just sort of live there i think we would also tackle this because of the class disparities and the issues which come from this right i believe that the sort of analysis that the proposition brings is sort of innately absurd at the point at which they don't recognize from what sort of backgrounds do ethnic enclaves even arise and what is the capacity of them to be able to segregate themselves out of these cities right We're telling you uh, at the point at which they're already not so uh, 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 so disintegrated the 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 the, 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 like the gating off of them is is like nonsensical okay the only the idea of like no on the diversion of resources and when they say like this is like the the entirety of our case but like uh, 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 it falls at the entire point you know when just rich people get mad for losing the privileges that they have or etc like but presumably i would claim that lower class people who are gonna get far far more pissed at the point at which you know they actually can perceive and see the massive inequalities which operates within their city at the point at which there no longer is a two meter wall behind the pool and the mansion and all of these things at the point at which you know you see that you have droughts and shortages of water of energy within your city yet the electricity is always Whatever running within that nice gated community but telling you this actually causes people to mobilize and agitize and antagonize the people who are stealing from them and is the point at which like the push for the the allocation of resources which are going to be much better actually stands right we're telling you that the comparative on their side of the house when they say you know that the rich people are going to steal anyway when the rich people have the interests that they have anyways right i think the margin of change on their side of the house is still far lower than it is on our right uh, than it is on our side right? we're telling you that visibly showing that corruption and inequality is incredibly important then like, the idea of safety and then them saying that you know you have the ability to choose you know to be safe to live in these communities uh, and etc but we're telling you why are the uh, privilege of safety allowed to only uh, 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 like uh, uh, allowed for such a slim minority of people within a city right 
right? Why is comfort reserved for such individuals? We're telling you, if these individuals want comfort, Even they maybe. mustn't and they don't, shouldn't have the ability to run away from the cities they inhabit, to run away from the natural ecosystems and the societies which they are supposed to be a part of, right? Of which they are supposed to also make them better, right? Of which they have also the responsibilities to, you know, cohabit and live together in unity with other city inhabitants, right? We're telling you at the point at which you actually do feel unsafe as like a rich individual, where perhaps you are now facing reality, perhaps places. now it is the point at which, you know, something is going to change, right? Then uh, the idea of the freedom of association, and you know, you, you have like, you know, the ability to form yourself into within these communities. We're telling you that, A, you are not like ba the banning people from associating with one another, like, no, you can still be friendly with your neighbors, you can still have friends within the, like your communities or etc. But we're telling you that this right and freedom of association, while it's not being damaged on our side of the house, what is damaged on their side of the house is that you have a city which is being uh, disallowed for the freedom of access, the freedom of association within the city you yourself inhabit. If I want to go to a concert on a, or am I rushing to a really hot date, you know, it's really bad when I like, you know, get uh, like a wall just, you know, uh, standing right in front of me at the point at which, you know, when I want to go to the park, at the point at which, you know, I am rushing to go there to bring someone flowers or etc. It's really unfun for me and really not nice that I cannot see the houses in my city and I cannot walk directly where I want to walk, where I cannot be where I want to be, when it is segregated, okay. right? Then with the idea, you know, of you know how the, on their side of the house only then you have you know neighbors interacting with one another or etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. But like this is nonsensical. First of all, let me point out who this concedes with our case, with the material that we have brought to you of how the association of people of different classes, of the uh, forced uh, forced uh, uh, you, know, you know seeing of one another is actually going to bring detrimental benefit, like it's gonna, not detrimental, it's gonna bring ultimate benefits to our case, right? Because when the people are actually like you no know, friendly with one another, the point you can see each other's interests on etc uh, is the point of which you know socially or even systematically a change occurs right and we're telling you that you can still be friendly with your neighbors on our side of the house i don't think it is exclusive to close it at, uh, communities okay i can take a point uh rich people know poor people exist the problem is they don't care the difference on your side is that we're more hateful of these people when they lose. Okay, their okay, 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 okay. First of all, not all like okay, even within these like rich people's families, you have you know like young people who have been closeted off the world for the entirety of their lives, right? You still have people who are not like rich there by choice, and these people don't know. They don't actually know what the lives are like, right? The 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 the, the, the information uh, uh, the access we allow is still marginally different on our side of the house, right? Then on the idea of you know like uh, like the lobbying and that the people are going to be like against the public housing and etc the rich people are going to be mad but the public housing already doesn't exist within these gated communities right I'm telling you that the comparative care is at the, at the point at which the rich people are forced to confront the issues of their city changes more likely to occur then the, let's move into our third argument which is also like uh, uh, like uh, on the idea that you know they said like the benefits are going to be lost on rich people and so the rich people are going to be upset okay we claim you that then they are actually losing some privileges we are, which we are like then, you know, mean co like making communally accessible, right? This is incredibly important as the, uh, when there is already well, like, very well established these communities, especially in the developing world where there is mass inequalities of cities with huge houses and favelas contrasting one another. At the point at which you tear down the walls, you abolish the private security and the masses are allowed to go through. Everyone is given access to the parks, to the utilities, to the cultural objects, which are so much better developed than any other neighborhoods in those areas. Just imagine the Sri Lankans, like, you know, storming the presidential palace much recently, you know, having fun in the pools, playing around, etc. right? Having the ability to access the life of wealthy people, which I think is giving refuge, is the reclaiming of land, the reclaiming of the city, and the reclaiming of freedom. Incredibly proud to propose. Thank you. Give me just a second to go grab some water and uh, we can continue with the next speaker.
Um, Australia, sorry, just a quick reminder if you guys are able to sort of scoot in to even if in the background, uh, show your faces. I think we turned a backup computer on, so we should be, we should have two people visible on one. Perfect, I can see that. I, I missed it. My bad. I'm so sorry. Oh, no, it's all good. Or in Varshini, was it something I needed to catch? Not at all. Okay. All right. Uh, judges all set. Excellent. We thank the speaker for their speech and call upon the second opposition speaker to deliver them. Okay. Cool. Uh, just a reminder, I would like POIs in the chat, please. Uh, and assuming I'm visible and audible, then I shall begin this speech in three, two, one. I'm going to do a few things in this speech. Firstly, notes of recharacterization on why this is about ethnic minorities and why we win that stakeholder because they have not rebutted them. Then on assuming their characterization, why you do get worse cities, why you do get more segregation. But firstly, I'd just like to respond to the point of the extension brought forward by second uh, affirmative. Because I feel sorry that he thinks that he can't go on a hot date to places in like in the like, gated communities. But I think that concerts are not what are getting locked off for these people. I think these are merely amenities. These are things such as like you probably have a pool, you might have a park. That doesn't mean parks do not exist elsewhere. I think that you are not losing out on nearly as much as they want to characterize. And their attempt to claim as much benefit as possible really limited the truth of that extension. Because the reality is that you don't actually gain access to that much more, because there is going to be access to parks, to concerts, because concerts want people to go to them, so they're not going to base themselves in gated communities that only a few can access. It is going to be accessible for lots of people. But I'll point out why even if it is a lot that you're losing out on, you lose out on more under our side, uh, on the underside uh, proposition anyway. So firstly, a note of recharacterization. Because importantly, observe that when we brought, bring forward the stakeholder of ethnic enclaves, the only response they get is to say that they are unlikely. They never prove that it is a bad thing for us. That means that if I can prove that they are a stakeholder that exists in the debate, you at least at this point must credit this as a win to side opposition because they have not given a way in which they win that stakeholder. Why do we think that stakeholder is likely to be part of the scope of this debate? Because we tell you that when people migrate from country to country, there is a prerequisite amount of money that you need to have to be able to make that move. To be able to move as a professional from somewhere such as China to somewhere such as the US, you must have the money to relocate across oceans. That means that you are likely to be someone that does have the amount of money that you can buy into these communities. Secondly, they say that the money is significant because you need to buy like significant plots of land. But we point out that diasporas often already form communities in these areas. That even if they are not actively gated, they're likely to buy land that is near each other because they want that sense of community, meaning that land probably already exists. The difference is that you can also then build a wall that means you are less likely to be vilified in hate crimes under, side, uh, under our side because you are more safe from people that are actively aggressive towards you. The importance of that is that we're able to prove that is a stakeholder in this debate. We also give you reasons at first why they're a significant stakeholder because these are people that, that, that are more likely to specifically care about safety compared to other people that just want wealth. They're more likely to not have other choices such as moving to other communities that means that they are more likely to be a significant stakeholder a stakeholder the side proposition cannot win because their only response is being to say maybe they don't have the money here are the reasons that i just gave why they do nextly let's assume their characterization then because that's the only ground on which they can have a chance in this debate let's assume that they're able to that this debate is about wealthy communities what do they tell us the first thing that they tell us at first is that you're likely to have damaging uh, like fund allocations under our side they say that you're likely to have allocations of fund that directly go towards gated communities that means that you're likely to have an inability to, and secondly, they say that there is an inability to scrutinize that because they are gated communities. I'll respond to both of these. Firstly, why you actively get more fund allocations in a dangerous manner on the side proposition. Because firstly, we just tell you that it is not exclusive. Because if you're able to directly divert money to gated communities, you can probably directly divert things such as power and resources to suburbs that still have wealth disparities to other suburbs, meaning you're likely to still have discrepancies and that it's likely to directly go towards those kind of communities. But what we bring you in our substantive is reasons why actually suburbs become even more unequal because you probably can't direct things that are just to gated communities. You probably direct them to the suburb that includes that area, which means that currently, if there is public housing needs but not in a gated community, they still get the benefits of the amenities that are built outside the gated community, but for the people inside to still access. That looks like restaurants that want greater patronship than just the people inside the community. But now it's a lot harder to build things such as public housing in wealthy areas because there's more likely to be lobbying against it. And they give the direct incentives for this when they want to talk about often people such as politicians living in gated communities, which means not only do they have the incentive, but they have the means as the actual people in the halls of power to do things such as direct funding, funding away from 
uh, from public housing in those areas. So that means you actively get it less equal and the, and, and the ability to still funnel money in that direction is even greater. But the last thing to say then is that they say, uh, the, 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 the second thing is it's probably easier for us to just redirect capital in a more equal manner, given that we're not spending uh, spending political capital taking down gated communities. We can probably just like register to some ability to just make it more equal under our side. But lastly, they say that it's easier to criticize I think it's actually a lot easier to criticize when there is a gated community because there is a very visible wall and you can say, hold on, why are all the parks being built within that wall? That's a really visual cue that something is not being distributed equally. Comparatively, if there is not actively that certain kind of gate, it's easier to just brush it off as going towards a general area because maybe there's green space. It's a lot easier to criticize under our side when you can have gated communities. That's why, that's why you're likely to have better cities under our side and their material does not stand. The last thing then to discuss, I guess, is this idea of the principle, because they want to say that it's problematic if you reserve resources just for some people. I responded in my intro about why you're actively not going to be directing money away from like really, really important things, such as like, I guess, doctors, such as things such as restaurants, because those are things that need significant patronship beyond just a single gated community. These are likely to be things such as residential areas. They're likely to be people that live together. They probably share things such as like, uh, like, like, like parks. But I think that that means you can still access everything that you want to elsewhere. The difference is the freedom of association that we get and we're able to point out an allegory we point out things such as like clubs that can ban access that they do not dispute that it is a legitimacy to do that that means that we are able to win on the on the principle because they want to say that it's our burden to prove the rights to exclusion but i think it's actually their burden to prove that the, there is an uh, obligation to not let people associate completely freely under their side i think we're able to better allow people to have freedom in that regard and i think that the importance of that is that what we're able to establish i, I, I guess the last thing to do here is a note of weighing very directly which is say that you're weighing the ability for some people to access more resources versus the ability for some people to actively feel safe where they live because if they do not live within walls they're likely to be vilified in things such as hate crimes i think it's clear that it's far more important that you weigh more significantly the right for people to feel safe where they live because they come from ethnic communities that are likely to get vilified than the right for everyone to access one other park when there are other parks and they can access elsewhere before i move on to a point of substantive i'll take a poi though Okay, could you please establish, like, do you think that you're going to establish public housing within the gated communities? Could you please provide any mechanism as to why public utilities are better off on your side? The point isn't that you build public housing within gated communities. It's that gated communities are only a subset of the areas that use some forms of public resources. There are some public amenities which exist inside gated communities. There are others which exist outside but are still accessed by those inside. That looks like restaurants that want greater patronship than just the people within gated communities. That looks like public resources such as like, I guess, uh, I guess doctors. Uh, that means that it's still beneficial. If we can prove that we get more public housing outside the gated community, that's something that we did at first by establishing that given that the reason why people opt into gated communities is that they feel like they want safety, they feel like they want uh, ability to self-associate. If you ban them from being in a gated community, they still want that. They just find other means to segregate themselves. That looks like advocating for problematic zoning laws. That means you get less public housing. Please respond at third. Point is substantive, why this fuels dangerous backsliding narratives. Observe that this is a world where ideas of freedom and property are extremely loaded terms. And I think this policy is likely to be seen as a direct attack on things such as freedom. We look at right-wing populists such as Bolsonaro in Brazil. We look at Le Pen in France. We look at American Republicans, particularly Trumpian ones. And I think that this is incredibly important given their characterization that often the politicians themselves are the ones in the gated communities. This means that they have the direct incentive to want to continue to advocate for things such as freedom in other ways. And I think we've seen precedent against that because there has been counter lobbying against gun reform in the US to make it easier to carry guns because people are advocating against freedom. We think people criticize Black Lives Matter protests for things like property damage. I think this means that people are incredibly likely to actively advocate for greater levels of restriction and greater levels of segregation because they feel as if their freedom is being infringed. And this provides an alternate path to victory for us because irrespective of the outcomes limited to gated communities, this leads to aggressive reactionary political momentum that will seek to undo this policy and actively move backwards in other ways. At the end of this speech, the reality for side proposition was this was about ethnic enclaves in many cases. They could not win their stakeholder. Even if it wasn't just about them, we won the other stakeholders as well. We oppose. Thank you. Judges all set. 
Neat. Thank you. So uh, we thank the speaker for their speech and call upon the third speaker of the team proposition to deliver that. Yeah, my pronouns are she, her, the wise, and chat. The only response we got from up to three of our mechanisms of change is, oh, but you still have parks and cinemas under our side of a house. Tell that to Brazilians in favelas, tell that to the lower class in Colombia panel, they assume that everyone has privileges and never tackles the essence of our case, the evil in segregation. They dare to talk about the attack on freedom while they close off thousands of people from quality of services they lose. Before moving on to three th themes in my speech, firstly, why principle wins us the debate. Secondly, what will the rich do? But, but third of all, I'll analyze the grounded benefits the poor people get on our side of a house. I have three points on strategy and like rebuttal. Firstly, I want to outframe their points on ethnic enclaves, right? Because, uh, we, because notice how for like safe upkeeping a wall, constantly controlled uh, individuals are rich and definitely, definitely not governmentally disenfranchised, societally oppressed communities, right? Notice how if you have enough money to move from China to the US, they themselves can see that you have enough money, even if they form enclaves, they are rich enclaves. So this is fundamentally inexclusive, right? But Notice how, but, but second of all, right, when they say that they will solve inequality, like on a fiat of, of banning like a wall on our side of a house, they're simply ludicrous, they could not claim this alternative. And third of all, on their third argument, notice how it is simply unfeasible because they cannot undo the policy at the point at which the majority of the population gets literally much much more access to the city and like this this would be a publicly like supported policy they cannot claim that right so on to the first thing then on principle notice how this one's us the debate right because they never answered it right we told you how city belongs to its people it should not belong to certain individuals who happen to be simply lucky right why do i have to, to walk three miles longer towards my Uh, excuse me, I'll have to pause you. You're breaking up for me. A gated community in my way, so I have to go around it, right? Why do certain people deserve beautiful parts more than the others? Opposition. Yeah, hi. Um, I'm the only one still on and uh, connected to the other internet. Okay. Um, wait, wait, they're right beside me. They just disconnected from the internet. They're okay. Back, so. I have paused the timer at, I stopped hearing clearly at 157. Judges, do you have timers as well? Is that approximately when? Yeah, it's exactly the same for me. Okay. Yeah, 157. Uh, the last thing I have noted is being unable to take a uh, three mile walk around something. Uh, does that sound approximately where you were at 157? Yeah, I can start from there. Okay. Uh, we are set whenever you. Yeah. Yeah, if you would start. So it is fundamentally unclear why do certain people deserve more beautiful parks than the others. Opposition is awfully exclusionary, right? It is infuriating that someone is being allowed to live in a way that they could ignore like public issues, which are uh, which the majority of the population have to endure, right? This regards the dignity of individuals. This regards the way you feel valued as a human being within your society. Thus, this already takes us the debate, even given, especially given that they can see uh, that like that these individuals like are important uh, in the debate, right? But second, moving on to my second theme then, what will the rich do? This was a more expansive point, right? What did they tell us? They told us that the rich will get angry on our side of a house because they will get upset that they lost these communities and they are less likely to get public housing. Two responses. First of all, the fact that the rhetoric of opposition implicitly concedes that the rich are so antagonized from poor people and want to minimize the interactions with them, are scared or annoyed by them, only points to the fact that there is no bigger incentive, better motivation to help these people on their side of a house than on our side of a house. If they hate the poor people so much, why would they ever be helped on opposition, right? And here it's important to analyze the incentives to help the poor like on either side of a house. And this leads me to my second response, right? What are the incentives? 
incentives. We see these are symmetrically fickle, given not giving these individuals that uh, that public housing is financially like beneficial to the rich, right? And thus is already pushed to the limits under the status quo, right? It is pushed to the point where the poor cannot do anything already, right? The mechanisms of wanting to be reelected or like fearing revolt, for example, are symmetric and are symmetrically effective on either side of a house, thus the incentive to care about the opinions of the poor are symmetric too, right? But second of all, notice how they never answer to our second argument on funding, so it still stands, right? So at our worst case, we have symmetric funding, but note it, but we also like have more scrutiny of the rich. At our best so however, we have much more funding, much more. This was our argumentation, they never tackled. We told you two things. First of all, we told you how this individual who are these gate cap communities are being able to uh, to to be held accountable much more on our side of a house, right? Because where does gatekeeping happen? It is where the inequality is the biggest, right? In Brazil, like in the in developing nations where the richest live like lavish lives and the poorest individuals literally start, right? Where the rich want to hide themselves the most due to the guilt and shame they would be put to due to people recognizing their shallow and uh, shallow and vain like opulence, right? And overconsumption, where the lavish lives deprive the most vulnerable. When this is allowed to be in the public eye, right? This fosters media and societal out outreach, right? This is the point at which we mobilize individuals to actually go and demand things from the government we mobilize them to vote and like make a change right but second of all notice how we have like a better perception of the world that the rich have on our side of a house, right? Who we interact with impacts our perception of the world, right? People feel like foreigners to one another on opposition when everyone you see is just like you, right? When you're afraid of the people who are different, right? As they can see on our side of a house, the rich individuals, privileged children on our, on our side are much more likely to establish connections with poor individuals and assimilate, right? This is how you get much more empathy and understanding, right? We are normalizing interacting with other social classes, and this is the first step towards understanding their issues. This is what actually gives an additional incentive to see them as humans and deserving of help in the long term and actually listen to them when they demand things. And they can see this in their first argument that connections are a possible and likely and b valuable so this is the point at which they cannot run away from this concession and they already like lose right notice how we take then this clash because our worst case is like is symmetric but on our best means that we have much more scrutiny like like off the rich and better individual living, right? And given that this was main path to victory, this wins us the debate on their grounds already, right? But notice how, I, uh, before I move on to my uh, second, third theme, I'll take up your line. If currently the class difference is as extreme as slums versus gated communities as you say, why do you not just get isolated suburbs of the rich under your side? I have a bad internet. And that why, so I'm just going to move on to my third theme, right? So I want to assume that uh, if, even if like we predict what the rich individuals will do, notice how we have like uh, two key grounded benefits that are insured on our side of a house, regardless of what rich individuals do, right? We told you two things on our side of a house. Notice how ritual life of the poor individuals, right? Notice how only on our side of a house we lighten up their lives, right? When you are able to escape the miserable, crumbling, vastly underfunded neighborhoods and breathe in the air of the forest that would be other, uh, otherwise be closed off on opposition by these gated communities, this is what relieves like a bit of a burden from your family, from you as an individual, right? This ultimately uplifts you. But second of all, notice how when you are able to establish connections and have like rich friends on our side of a house, you have much more opportunities in life, right? Because you get more, they could help you in job in the job market, right? They could help you like to uplift yourself if you are in a bad situation, right? Notice so under our side of a house, you get much, much more of these benefits, right? And they are inconsiderate, right? That the parts that the poor get on their side of a house are vast underfunded they couldn't run away from this they could not just outframe us of the debate right so because we win on principle we have better rich people incentives and we have grounded benefits for the poor people we take the debate thank you Uh, this this was likely not the plan in the first place, but just a recommendation that the proposition reply speaker speaks from a different device, just to make sure that the internet problems do not persist. Um, yeah.
Judge is all set. Oh, sorry. Sorry about that. Uh, assuming I'm audible and visible. Yep. Okay. Uh, yeah, we thank the third speaker on Brock for their speech and call upon the third level session speaker to deliver theirs. Side proposition want to win this debate in a characterization where deeply segregated racist societies solve racism because white people see a black person on the street for the first time. Taking them at a realistic best case scenario, they make a few of the racist people living in those isolated communities a little less racist. But you know what is guaranteed all the time? That a bunch of the other racist people that are in that community are now far more likely to have very negative interactions from the people they try and profess they care about. It was really meaningful when the first speaker couldn't respond to our POI we gave you. Even if you don't believe this debate is about ethnic enclaves, assuming that this exposure therapy mechanism is what's going to like solve racism, they would stand for the breaking up of all Chinatowns just so a few more white people would see an Asian person. Noting they make life incredibly, incredibly far harder for the people they profess to care about. I'm gonna do three things in this speech. Firstly, I'm gonna deal with the characterization, proving why we immediately and like can guarantee a win based on who we think this debate is also about. Then I'm gonna deal with the principle and thirdly, with the practical. On the first question of characterization, we tell you, you need a feel and you need a capacity in order to set up these communities. This opposition only talks about white people saying in a kind of offensive way that minorities can't be rich or to have the capacity to set this up. We would tell you Arabic professionals in France have good reason and perhaps may have the money to want to set up a gated community. Chinese professionals who live in diasporas in the US would have the ability and would have the want during COVID. Jewish gated communities and Italy facing consistent anti-Semitism probably have a means and a reason, assuming in some cases, for this to be set up. Therefore, these do fall in the scope of the debate. And at that point, the only response we hear from side proposition, well, it's classism then, if some people can access it, and that's unequal. Well, like, okay, just because only some people can access a feeling of safety, if these people have a meaningful fear in the first place, that's probably a good side for our side of the house. And secondly, no, this doesn't respond from the fact that you can still be discriminated on ways that aren't just classism, that can be, for example, xenophobia. So noting right from the get-go, we get an immediate win based on a number of people who are in gated communities and will have to be banned, shut down under side proposition's case. Now moving on to the principle, what we hear from them is this idea of barring freedom, having pretty rhetoric about city centers not accessible. First of all, that is not the debate. We're not talking about forests. These are residential areas. Keep that in mind. Second of all, it's unclear why they do have access in the counterfactual, because they talk to about South Africa as a very, very segregated society. It's unclear why just really rich, like rich suburbs are still going to be existing, meaning you still have this meaningful segregation in the third place. We tell you this is contention because it's about guaranteeing that these people will be able to live in these areas still, right? Because of all the analysis we give you as to why we make it far harder for them to live in these, that is ultimately contingent. The only thing that stands that is not contingent is this principle barrier that we set up. You are in the head, like in, from the get-go, you are banning this. You are actively taking away people's ability to like live how they want to and associate how they want to. That is a second win we can claim on opposition. Now, on to the third part of this debate about how this plays out practically. I'm gonna do four things. Firstly, I'm gonna to talk to you about this mechanism of exposure and why that is fundamentally wrong. Second of all, I'm gonna talk about allocation of funding, proving why that also lets us win. And thirdly, about media accountability, then about backsliding narratives. On the first, about exposure as their like main mechanism of achieving change. Three responses. First of all, we reject the idea that you have no idea of the conditions that are outside of your society. Noting these are residential areas. Most people do not work in residential areas. Most of them would have jobs somewhere else. That means they still see black people, they still see other different groups and they choose not to live with them. That shows you, assuming we're taking that characterization as like the best case of opposition, this is only about like racist white people. These are the most racist white people if you wanna talk about that. Secondly, we say we reject this allows free assimilation. Noting, as I've established, if they buy what their analysis, these are gonna be incredibly racist people. You talk about literally South Africa. That means if friends in the playground to solve racism isn't going to happen. That means that the, what they're talking about in this debate 
It's not an exposure therapy and for people who are amenable to contact. It's people who do not want that contact and therefore are not receptive to it. Thirdly, it is notable, as I flagged in my introduction, the lack of response at first, because we tell you that it's incredibly important the interpersonal impact that you guarantee is happening. Because assuming there is now this free co-mingling of people in a lot of instances under their side, just immediately worse. We would tell you how the protesters literally where people will stand on their lawns with guns. These are people who set up these gated communities. If you want them to believe they are going to go like not really care about what they think as like crime like infested neighborhoods because they are incredibly racist. It's unclear why they're not going to be incredibly racist in real life. Because those black people's lives so much better to the way they interact with them on a day-to-day -day basis. Secondly, I'm going to deal with this allocation of funding, proving why we also went on a structural level. Noting firstly, that given the characterization, it's unlikely we're going to have see like moves or massive shifts that you can just become rich suburbs. Noting the same things happen for them, zoning laws like education mean you do not access the same things. Therefore, that is symmetric at best, but we actually say it makes things worse. That is to say, Although opposition tries to tell you there are no public housing in these neighborhoods, that's not the point. At the point in which you cannot directly invest money in a way which will only guarantee you give it to that gated community, assuming that's happening, you don't have to make a radius where assuming you don't want like who, people who you think are committing crime to be around you, you want to push them as far as possible because you can not guarantee yourself the safety of a wall. That looks like further pushing for tough on crime rhetoric. That looks like shutting down public housing. That looks like increasing rent prices. That is incredibly bad. No opposite response is that essentially, oh, it doesn't, it's not, not going to be the same as like the best asymmetric. We say that especially considering these tend to be like big cities, when we want to talk about Sao Paulo and the US, these are like going to be areas where you're pushing people out of their homes that are the massive harm they have to cop. I'll take a point. The antagonism arises from not seeing minorities as humans, from lack of interaction and lack of countering scapegoat narratives via live communication. Do you want to keep minorities away forever? No, the thing we tell you is that when you actually make minorities lives a lot worse at the point in which people who have seen the other and decided they don't like it, you're now forcing them to interact with people of that minority on a day-to-day -day basis at your best case. That doesn't make much sense. It makes life a lot worse. Therefore, noting, we can also get a structural win on how they're making life worse for marginalized communities. That is because this kind of overdevelopment they try to wash by their third speaker can actually fall to our side of the debate, noting that a large number of people in areas that these people in gated communities now no longer have the ability to like um, siphon their money out of means they're far more likely to push people out. They're far more likely to result in meaningful harm, another win for side opposition. So then I'm gonna talk about this idea of media accountability, which they tell us we haven't responded to. We literally did at second. We tell you, first of all, the fact that they discuss problems like drought, but people already knew what was happening in these cases is telling. Secondly, it's unclear the change when suburbs and characterizations mean that the government is going to be acting in bad ways anyway. And third of all, we flip this to say a visual cue of a wall is probably a better signifier of the disparity that exists. Therefore, we can also guarantee a win on media accountability. If you believe any side has the ability to increase it, it is only side opposition. On the last question of this debate, where we get no response about these backsliding narratives, note the scale that plays out on this debate and how it's another path to victory we give at second substantive. That is because People who do not live in these gated communities, but perhaps align themselves with ideas of like freedom, of wanting to protect their home and their family, now get really scared when it's seen as the other is trying to enc encroach upon you. As seen the point with the government is trying to force this intermingling of communities where they don't want it to happen. That looks like more reactionary momentum, more racism in these societies they profess to care about. At the end of this debate, we get our first win based on communities that they never want to talk about, like um, ethnic minorities. We get our second win based on the principle, noting the high barrier of harm. Third of all, we win on the practical grounds of this debate at the point at which you make minorities' lives harder, at the point at which you force them out of their homes, at the point at which you inflame already existing narratives we're incredibly proud to oppose. Thank you. Uh, can I confirm that I'm audible? Yep. Judges all set. Excellent. We thank the third speaker of side opposition and ask for the reply speaker of side opposition to deliver their speech.
there are two questions in this reply. First, how does this affect minority communities? And second, how does this affect the gay communities of equality? Firstly, how does this affect these minority communities? And I'm starting with this because it's the easiest way for us to win the debate. Because the strategy of this opposition on this issue is to ignore the whole set of people which we give you for first. And importantly, we give you reasons why this set of people is likely to exist whilst they assert that they don't. The reason that we give from first is that these people are likely to feel less safe in the other areas, regardless of the socioeconomic status. Which is to say that the exclusive benefit of a gated community is safety. And for the people who are suffering right now, people who are discriminated against, that is something that only that gated community provides, and therefore they are likely to be the ones who are likely to use it in many cases. They have no response down the bench. Our reply is clearly too late. The only response that they have here is that they say that some minorities don't have money. The first thing that I would note is that it's not that much money to build a gate, which we explain down the bench. The second thing that we explain that in many cases, skilled migrants do have enough money to do this. But finally, I would note that on strategy, this is mitigation at best. Obviously, this group does exist. This opposition cannot run away from it when we know it is an empirical reality. What is the importance of this? Because even if you believe that this is a small set of people, I think that if you believe nothing else, this is sufficient for us to win the debate. Because it means people feeling safe when they go to bed at night, when they walk the streets at night. And note, safety is a prerequisite for many of these communities to access many other rights, which means that safety in this debate is what you must weigh incredibly highly. Because you don't really have the right to move around and speak in the ways that you want if you don't know whether you're going to be discriminated against. You don't know the ways that people react. If you don't know whether your life will be on the line because you live in a community that hates your race, that hates you, who you are, your identity. That is necessarily what this opposition portrayed off. And that is what hurts the Arabic family in France. That is what hurts the Asian family in America during the COVID crisis. And this opposition has no response. And note that the reason why you have to weigh that is because even in their best case, where you believe that some rich people become a bit more friendly, you have to weigh that against the enormous amount of racism and discrimination that is likely to happen under their side, which they have no response to in that debate. That is not only a harm, but that is the stripping away from their rights, which is principally abhorrent. We give you down the, this down the bench and you have to weigh that. But secondly, how does this affect the, the banning? Of, how does the banning of these gated communities affect equality? And this notably allows us to win on opposition's metrics, even if you buy nothing that we have already explained. Their claim is that they help more people because they become more equal. We flip that by explaining this actually worsens the equality that exists. Firstly, because something is stripped away from people in power, which means they are more likely to be afraid. Secondly, because presupposed opinions and more contact creates the fear that people feel like they're being attacked. Their only response is to say that is symmetric. It is not for the reason that we explained that fear increases when you open up these gates, when you open up these communities, and that necessarily means that they're likely to treat them worse. What does that look like? It means like explicitly crack downing upon them. It means lobbying against housing there. But secondly, it means raising prices of services in those areas, which we give you from birth, and explain why even if they don't have the motive to do this, simply the fact that you are living in this area means that you now have like higher living costs. Even in their best case, if rich people hate these people so much, at best they have segregated rich suburbs, and that is something that is still functionally unequal. But what you have to weigh that against is the unique material we give you from outside, which is that this destroys the political will to do other things. Because notably, segregated suburbs is worse than these gated communities, because we explain that there's a veneer of legitimacy that exists. Which is to say that under their side, it's much harder to pass social policies, which are likely to actually improve the substantive, uh, the, the substantive measures that make these people's lives better. It means that under our side, we're more likely to get public housing outside of those gated communities because the rich people aren't scared that these people are invading. That is necessarily only something we can claim. The final mechanism they rely on is that if they contact, they will therefore treat each other with more respect. Notably, we explained out of the bench that often contact is antagonistic, and that necessarily means that you worsen the tensions between these groups, especially when these people feel like they're being invaded. And under their own characterization, those are the people in power, those are the politicians who are likely to actually entrench that equality. At the end of this debate, we say that it's only under our side that is engaged with the true characterization of what these communities have looked like. This opposition is not, and that is why you must vote side opposition. Thank you. Judges all set. Excellent. We thank the opposition reply speaker for their speech and call upon the proposition reply speaker to close up this debate for us. Okay.
I start in three, two, one. Okay, firstly, a strategic note on ethnic enclaves. Okay, I think there is supposed to be a differentiation here as to what are the sort of ethnic enclaves which actually exist in reality and how they are established. At the point at which, you know, they characterize the people who are already professionals who have real allocated into Europe, into the United States, or et cetera, which are already in innately wealthy individuals, we in uh, uh, intuit that they are already able to ensure the safety that they have. They're likely to live in better neighborhoods. They're likely, you know, to have private security or no locks on their doors, which are like uh, electric or etc., which I like don't have, you know, and all of these things. And further on, it's not where the majority of hate crimes even occur and how ethnic enclaves are established in reality. It's mostly like Chinese towns in the United States were built by industrial workers who built their railroads in the United States who are not wealthy, who are lower class, and who are like being, being forcefully segregated into these communities. This is not the agent we are trying to address within this debate, right? But then in further, furthermore, at the point at which, you know, these are wealthy professionals. We are believing that uh, the class disparity is far more important than the racial disparity because it's often what is actually leading their lives and what provides their privileges, interests, and etc. Right. Further on, we never claim to solve racism. We only want to limit the alienation of people from one another, the city dwellers. If they want to like characterize it, you know, the people who are going to feel invaded, as like the proper, like the reply speaker said, you know, uh, of you no know, and fearing these things and etc. They basically can justify Trump building his wall because the like white Americans are afraid of the ethnic minorities who are coming in and that they shouldn't be allowed in the first place to go into this gated off country, which is the U.S. This fortress this gated community which it is then they claim then okay now moving into our content and the reply they said well still the rich wealthy people are going to build their own suburbs but the importance here is is there is no wall okay now let's talk about the significance and the importance of the wall of defense we're telling you that first of all the strength of the wall comes from the physical barrier that it inhibits it fundamentally shows the exercise of power and control it shows having the ability to occupy mass plots of land and under exclusive ownership and the feeling of superiority. We're telling you that fundamentally this limits the physical freedom and the amount of freedom the city dwellers are allowed to have. The amount of freedom which you are able to exercise is being segregated within the city. Their wealth, the, wealthy, uh, the wealthy people own more of the city because they can move exclusively anywhere. The, 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 the people of the lower classes are forced to move in mazes. They are forced to uh, go around the walls, right? We're telling you the, uh, the limitation of physical freedom is what is significant, what has never been refuted by side opposition. Then it is the access of information. When you build a wall, you cannot see over the wall. This is important, right? Wall limits how much you see. For like, no, the, 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 the regular city liver, the gated off community, which has its own private guard, which has its own wall. It is a world of mystery. It is a world of secrets. For a child, it is an entirely separate kingdom. It is a thing which is not part of their reality, right? What well, we're telling you why this like like this access of information is so incredibly important is because at the point at which you can uh, you can actually see with your eyes, you can actually feel pissed, feel mad, the point at which you can see the physical inequalities which are within your city, at the point at which when a drought is happening in your country and you can see that the pools are still full, that the gardens are still being watered, is the point at which we are telling you the information is crucial to have for the individuals who actually live within those cities to actually know where the resources which are public are being used. But further on, it creates a disparity of superiority and inferiority, right? We're telling you at the point at which you build a wall, you are able to feel superior over others who are able to establish this physically. We're telling you this is incredibly important, especially for kids, because we don't want them grow, to grow up such pompous assholes as their parents are. That's why we want to destroy those fences. Incredibly proud to propose. Thank you very much to the proposition reply speaker and to everyone for this excellent debate. I will now stop the recording.